Good morning, good morning. Trinity, Trinity family. Good morning, Trinity family. Today is the third week of Advent. Last week, we lit the candle of peace. Today, we light the candle of joy. Do you ever think about how Mary must have felt after the angel Gabriel appeared to her? She was a virgin and promised in marriage, but Gabriel told her she would become pregnant and give birth to God's son. We can't imagine the fear that probably swept over her. How, how lonely she must have felt and how scared she must have been to face the next day. Who would believe her? How would Joseph react? God chose Mary. He chose a poor young girl to be the mother of his son, the Messiah. He chose the least of these to be the mother of the King of Kings. Even though she was selected by God to carry out an honorable task, this announcement would bring her ridicule and much pain. It would be years before her name would ultimately be cleared and lauded. This chosen girl, however, willingly submitted to God's plan. We, we read her response to God in Luke 1, 46-55. Even in the depths of uncertainty and loneliness, Mary sang praises to God, and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will, be, or will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Mary re re recognized that God had a plan for her. She oh. submitted to oh. his ad ad authority and called out to him, shouting and rejoicing, We too can and sing praise to God. This Advent season, we can rejoice. He sent his, his son into this earth and that he will send him again. Gracious Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name, Jesus, Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We lift our voices and our hearts and proclaim that there is no one greater than you, God. Than you, God. Help to soften our hearts so that we are filled with joy and hear your voice when you call to us. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, Trinity family. It is great to see you as we gather together, once again virtually today, and certainly would have loved to have had you join me in this absolutely beautiful sanctuary uh, that I'm in right now. I do want to say thank you for your willingness to connect online, and also just uh, for the fact that you're responding so well, even uh, given the, the limitations and the decision that we've had to make to suspend our in-person services for a little while. Well, as I'm looking at the beautiful uh, Christmas tree and the, and the decor in our sanctuary, you know, I'm thinking back to some of the wonderful events we've enjoyed together. Uh, last year, that amazing Christmas banquet at Will Ridge Community Center, that was a wonderful, wonderful time. I mean, the food, the music, the fellowship, the laughter, the, the, all of the things that we enjoyed. And that's a very, very precious memory. And I do hope that perhaps in years to come, well, certainly maybe not this Christmas, but next Christmas, I'd love to join you again for the Christmas banquet. Uh, and surely by that time, uh, we'll be back together again. Now, when I'm thinking of, uh, of, of the beautiful Christmas decor, I also could not help but recall uh, another banquet that happened. It was many, many years ago. Arlene was a first year student at Bible College and I was in my second year. Well, the Christmas banquet at our college in Regina, it was a big event. There were many, many romances that started at the Christmas banquet. In fact, uh, there were many marriages that could trace their origin to that particular Christmas banquet. Well, this is kind of how it worked. Uh, I happened to be down in the practice rooms, the music practice rooms one day. And Arlene was practicing just a few doors down. Uh, and I decided to go ahead and invite her to the Christmas bank. Well, at least find out if she was available. So I walked down the hallway and I poked in the door and he said, hi, Arlene, uh, by the way, are you going to the Christmas banquet? And she said, yes. And I said, well, are you going with anyone? And she said, no. Ah. So I said, well, would you like to go with me? And she said, sure. So, okay, we, if things were all set. Well, as it turned out, it, the day of the Christmas banquet, uh, I was really, really sick. In fact, I had the flu. Now, I think if I knew then what I know now about how contagious uh, the flu can be, I probably would not have done this. But later in the afternoon, I started feeling a little better, so I decided to go through with it. And this is the way it works. The guys were able to go to the women's dorm. The only time you could do it was at the Christmas banquet. And you could go and you could stand on the landing and then you could escort your date to the banquet hall. So I did that. I'm dressed up in my suit and I go to see Arlene and she comes out looking beautiful. And I gave her a corsage that I had uh, purchased from the florist. And we walked to the banquet hall and we're standing in line waiting to go in. And I started feeling really, really sick. And I said to her, Arlene, I'm so sorry, I, I can't do this. I have to go back to my room. So I went back to my room and I stood her up on our first day. And I went back and I went to bed. Well, the next morning I woke up and I was feeling good. So I picked up the phone and I called her. Well, she was <laughs> asleep. So I woke her up to invite her on a second day. And I said, uh, I feel so bad about what happened last night. Would, would you go out for dinner with me tonight? So we went to a restaurant called the Mark Twain in downtown Regina. And we had a wonderful time. Great conversation, good meal. I was in a borrowed car. And after dinner, we go out into the parking lot to the car. It was a brutally, brutally cold Regina winter evening. And I left the lights on. Battery was stone dead. I had to go back into the restaurant, no cell phones in those days, and I had to ask to use the phone. And I called the owner of the car, and he had to come in another car with jumper cables, start up the vehicle, and so on. Well, listen, no 
question, right? Arlene did not marry me for my brains. Uh, she did not marry me because I was some great gallant guy. <laughs> she married me in spite of you know, my shortcomings. Well, I've heard a lot of crazy stories about how people have met. And as a pastor, obviously, I've done a lot of premarriage stuff. I love meeting with couples. I love finding out their story. How did you meet? And some of the stories are really quite incredible. And yet I have to say, there is no first date that is crazier than the one that we are looking at as we move into the book of Ruth, uh, chapter 3. Now remember, this was not the first meeting of Ruth and Boaz. They met earlier. He's a wealthy landowner. She was a very poor uh, Moabite widow. And uh, he, she gleans in his field. And remember, he, he noticed her and he told his man not to harm her and actually to make it easier for her to intentionally leave more grain behind. So she really is starting to do okay and inner gleaning and so on. But, but there's nothing really romantic that happened in chapter 2. And things begin to move forward in a very, very uh, intimate direction as we move into chapter 3. But the story is absolutely crazy uh, as, as we look at it. So, so follow along in the text. Here it is. Uh, Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. One day, and we don't know how long the time had elapsed, but one day Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now remember the backstory to that is that when when Naomi and, and Elimelech and her two sons went to, to Moab some ten years earlier, it was because there there was a famine in Bethlehem. And remember, it was a tragic series of events. Uh, Naomi's uh, husband died. Her two sons married Moabite women. One of the sons married Ruth. But again, the, the, the guys died. And, and so and it ended up finally the only one to return to Bethlehem because there was food now in Bethlehem was the mother-in-law, Naomi and Ruth. But these women had nothing. They had no husbands. They had no likelihood of ever having children or grandchildren. They had no security. They were destitute. Uh, in, in Really, they, they had absolutely nothing going for them. But remember what happened? It says that when Ruth went into the fields in, in chapter 2, she, she goes out to glean in the field, and it just says, and it happened. As it turned out, she gleaned in the fields of Boaz. And Boaz, remember, was of the clan of Elimelech. So there was a relationship there, or a relative, uh, uh, from Ruth's, of course, deceased husband. Remember, Boaz treated her with great favor. And she goes back to, uh, to Naomi with an abundance of grain. And so here's the situation. Naomi's emptiness that she talked about earlier. You know, God just, uh, he's made my life empty. She's bereft of any joy and provision, and she's depressed, and everything has gone poorly in her life. Well, now the immediate crisis has been averted. She's now got food, so things are okay. And Naomi is not content just to have food. She wants now to go and develop a longer plan, longer-term plan of security. And she comes up with a scheme. And remember, note, note that note of necessity. I must find a home for you. Well, you will be well provided for. Now, I want to note at the beginning that I think Naomi had good intentions. She wanted to provide for Ruth's security. And in providing for Ruth's security, she also would ultimately ensure her own security. And so take a look, though, at what happened. In verse 2, now Boaz, so now she begins to unfold the plan that she has for Ruth. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Now when we sort of read this at first, it might almost sound like 
uh, Naomi had, you know, spies that were tracking Boaz in terms of his comings and goings, so she could kind of orchestrate this particular plan. I don't think we have to uh, kind of insinuate that at this point. I, I think it's, it, well, it's obvious that she grew up in Bethlehem, so she knew the farming calendar. She knew when it was seeding time, when it was harvesting time. She knew when the winnowing occurred. It would occur in the evening. And they would, they would, uh, it would be a, a flat, hard ground, that's when the wind would come up. And, uh, you know, the harvesters would throw the grain up into, a little bit up into the wind, and the wind would blow away the chaff, and the hard grain would, would fall to the ground and be gathered, and so on. So she, she knew this. She knew the drill. She grew up in this agricultural, uh, you know, kind of economy. Now, it, it sounds as though, when you, when you first read it, it, it sounds as though she was just simply trying to arrange an opportunity for Ruth and Boaz to have a conversation. I mean, they had spoken before, but that was it. Never, in a sense, privately on their own. Uh, so it's almost like Naomi was suggesting to Ruth, okay, Ruth, here is, here is your first date. I'm, I'm planning it for you. This is, this is what's going on. But, but the thing that is incredible is, this is now where it seems to be getting a little bit sketchy. I, I want you to think of this not only from how we would think of this in you know 2020, but imagine in that culture, you are hearing the story of what Naomi is advising Ruth to do, and your mind is starting to swirl because you're starting to think through what's going on here. Now, if, and by the way, if you're a parent and you've got young children in tow, right now you're probably saying to your kids, kids, you know, cover your ears. Well, I guess it's not cover your eyes because it's not on video. But she says, cover your ears because parents, they're hearing the story and they're starting to think, wait a minute, something is going to happen here that could be really morally sketchy. And it really does sound like it could be going in that direction. So notice what, in fact, what Naomi says. Look at verse 3. This is her advice to her daughter-in-law. Naomi says, wash, Ruth, wash, put on perfume. You know, get dressed up in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you were there until he has finished eating and drinking. Well, there is a pretty important question that I guess I'm thinking about right now. The question is, wait a minute, was Naomi's advice, was it a moral advice that she's giving? Was it immoral? Uh, was, it, was it prudent? Or was it, frankly, just kind of reckless? Now, I, I think, let's just back up for a moment. I mean, the, the dressing that she says, you know, dress up, wash, put on perfume, and so on. Uh, that is not just to sort of, um, well, just go out for a night in the town, as we might think of it today. You dress up to go maybe to a nice restaurant or so on, or the way that Arlene dressed up that first Christmas banquet uh, when I invited her out. There's an interesting uh, kind of a, a cross-reference we might think of. You remember in Second Samuel... Uh, chapter 12, and it, actually in verse 20, remember the occasion where David has this adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, and Bathsheba conceives, and they give birth to a son. But remember what happened, the son got sick, and David pleads with God for seven days. He won't even eat anything, and he, he lays on the ground, and he's crying out to God that he would heal his son. But as it turned out, God was not pleased with this relationship. And you remember what happened? The son died. And, and so it says that when the son died, David actually, he stopped mourning, which was itself kind of unusual. But, but what happens next is quite interesting. Because it says in verse 20 that David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And then it says he went on. Uh, and people, they, they, his servants gave him uh, food, and he ate, and so on. But notice the significance. So, so what does he do? He he washes, uh, he is dresses, he eats, and and everything in a sense is is now okay for him. And so, what is he doing? The the dressing that Ruth is now doing, the washing and the putting on the, the perfume and so on, in a sense what it is, it is now a signal to Boaz. Even in the dim light, he will see her 
he will uh, he will be able to smell her perfume and it was almost like saying my period of mourning over the death of my husband is now finished it's completed and now i am available well look at verse four when he lies down naomi is continuing to give instructions and she says this she says when he lies down note the place where he's lying then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. And Ruth says, I mean, she's a pretty, I think, simple. She's not particularly well-educated young woman. And she says, I will do whatever you say. She trusts it's her mother-in-law. And Ruth answered that. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. Okay, back to the question I asked just a moment ago. Naomi's actions or Naomi's advice, was it, was it moral? Was it immoral? Was it prudent? Was it wise? Or was it just kind of risky? Now see, the problem reading the text is, depending how you understand the text, we, we might draw some very, very different conclusions. Now, as, as I've been reading some commentaries on this, I've noticed that they, they tend to fall in one of two camps. There's one group that kind of views what Naomi has done as almost virtuous. I mean, she's just showing initiative. It's almost like um, the idea that, you know, don't just sit there. Don't, don't just, you know, faith is not just a matter of passively waiting for God to make the first move. You've got to do something about it. And there are some that say that Naomi was just doing something that was really good to kind of get the ball rolling. Another, though, less common view kind of views this as morally questionable. Now, I've read arguments on both sides, and you may or may not agree with me on this, but I tend to think that what she was advising Ruth to do was, well, if not morally questionable, I think it was clearly risky, and frankly, even though Naomi may have good, had good intentions, I think it was pretty bad advice. I mean, remember what we know of Naomi already. Naomi, uh, well, earlier in the book, she didn't display what I would say a whole lot of spiritual maturity. When she and Elimelech took the boys to Moab, remember, it was in the days of the judges, so it was not a particularly moral time in the nation of Israel, but it was even more immoral up in Moab. Remember, we noted that, uh, you know, she ha tends to be pretty focused on meeting the immediate needs. For her, it's just all about where's the next meal going to come from? And now she's thinking about how is Ruth's security going to be ensured and my security is really intertwined with her. So how will my security also be secured? Now, however we view the incident, I, I have to be honest, I don't find a whole lot uh, to commend Naomi about. She's putting Ruth at great risk. I mean, going out into the dark, going out to a strange place, going out unescorted in that culture where there were men who are sleeping and she's dressed in her finest clothing. Boy, does that sound like wise advice to you? Again, it was the days of the judges where everybody did what was right in their eyes. It is quite possible if other, another man woke up, or frankly, even if Boaz woke up, they could assume the worst and in fact why would a woman go to the threshing floor where men are sleeping only men there are no other women around well she could be viewed as a loose woman she could be considered a prostitute now the other thing to consider is that what if Naomi's scheme doesn't work out uh, it would put Ruth's whole reputation at risk I mean, what man is going to want to consider marrying Ruth who came unescorted to the threshing floor where a bunch of men, you know, were sleeping? By the way, you could also destroy, if it didn't work out according to plan, it could also destroy Boaz's reputations. So, so I, I don't think it was wise counsel. 
Now, I'm, I'm not prepared to go as far as some do that suggest uh, that Naomi was actually encouraging Ruth to seduce Boaz. But I think it's pretty clear that Naomi was putting Ruth and even Boaz in a morally compromising situation. By the way, commentators have noticed some parallels. And, and even as I'm telling you the story, you might be recalling a couple of other incidents. I, I think, for example, of Genesis 19. You know, it's a pretty sordid one where you've got the daughters of Lot. Uh, remember Abraham's nephew, and they ultimately get him drunk, and they take turns sleeping with him. It's a terrible story because they they are destitute. They think they have no future and no security, and, and, and so they want to take matters into their own hands. Or I think of another terrible example in Scripture in Genesis 16. Remember the story of Abraham and Sarah. God promises that he's going to provide them in their elderly years an heir. Well, they're getting really old. Nothing's happening. Uh, Sarah's barren. They're beyond. She's beyond the childbearing years. And so she comes up with a scheme. She says, Abraham, here's my maidservant, Hagar. You know, why don't you go sleep with her? And so, so again, the listeners to the story of Ruth and Naomi, they're, I, I, I expect that they're recalling these stories and they are expecting an outcome that is actually very different from what occurs. Look at verse 7 and following. Well, Boaz finished eating and drinking. He was in good spirits. He went over to lie down, far into the grain pile. Again, Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, lay down in the middle of the night. Poor guy's got cold feet, literally, right? In uh, the middle of the night, something startles the man. He turns, and there's a woman lying at his feet. I mean, it, it's a comical picture, honestly. Well, again, what does he say? You know, it's interesting. He notices a woman's at his feet. And to his credit, he begins to talk. He doesn't engage in anything inappropriate. He says in verse 9, who are you? And she says, I'm your servant, Ruth. And then notice this phrase. It is so key to understanding it. She says, spread the corner of your garment over me. Since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Now, you remember that back in, in Ruth chapter 2, when Boaz commended Ruth, uh, you know, she had left her homeland, she had left her family, she'd even left, you know, her gods, and now she'd embraced the God of Israel, and she had pledged herself to her mother-in-law to care for her, you know, all the days of her life. And remember, uh, Boaz said to her, you know, may you be richly rewarded by the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. Okay, now, now just remember that phrase, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. Well, what is interesting, as you go further in the text, is she, now she is saying, would you now cover me with your garment? And in the Hebrew language, the phrase uh, under your wings or under the corner of your garment is actually the same Hebrew phrase. So, so really what it is is a synonym. So what is she saying? Just as Boaz commended her for coming under the protection and under the refuge of the God of Israel, now what she is asking Boaz to do is to now be the one under whom she comes for refuge and for protection. And in essence, in that culture, what Ruth is doing is she is saying, I want to come under your protection as your wife. She is proposing marriage to Boaz. Wow, now this is really a regular. A woman proposing to a man, a foreigner proposing, a Moabite proposing to a prominent wealthy man of Israel, a servant proposing to her master, now, now, Boaz could easily have dismissed her. But he knew exactly what she was asking for. And he commends her. Look at what he does. Verse 10. The Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. That is to your mother-in-law. You've not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. I mean, he was obviously a fair bit older. 
now, my daughter, don't be afraid. Notice, I will do. In other words, you're asking me to marry you. I am going to do it, he says. I will do what you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. By the way, remember in Proverbs 31, when it talks about a virtuous woman, a woman of noble character? It's the same language. Ruth, in a sense, is the Proverbs 31 virtuous woman. By the way, she's not the only one of noble character, because look what follows. Verse 12, he says, Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. You know, Boaz does not take advantage of the situation. He knows the, the way things work in the nation of Israel. Now, the guardian redeemer in that culture, when, uh, let's say, a family member and someone in the extended family was going through a really difficult time, could be bereavement, it could be uh, they, someone has been, you know, taken their land and they, or they've had to sell their land because of economic uh, difficulties or whatever. Uh, or they, the guardian redeemer would kind of step in. They were like the protector of the family. Uh, guardian redeemers could do things like avenge the death uh, of a murdered relative or marry a childless widow. They could buy back family land. They could even buy back someone who had been sold into slavery. So, so in essence, what they were, they were the ones who would look after the needy, the vulnerable, you know, the helpless members. But the point is that it, the way it would start is you would, you would, the guards and redeemer would be the closest living relative. And Boaz knew that there was somebody, if you like, further up the line than he, he was for, sort of further back in the line. And so he is prepared to follow exactly the laws of the nation of Israel, not take advantage of the situation. And he will appeal to the one who's ahead of him and give him, if you like, first opportunity. Look at verse 13. He says, stay here for the night. By the way, nothing inappropriate happens here. In the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem. If he's not, as surely as the Lord lives, notice this oath, he says, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you're wearing, hold it out. When she did, he poured into it six measures of barley, placed the bundle on her, then she went back to town. That was a big load. Uh, in fact, it was even larger than the ephah that she had received in chapter 2. It was a burden so heavy that he had to lift it. She couldn't do it. He had to lift it and actually place it on her back. Well, Ruth goes back, reports to Naomi in verse 16. Naomi said, how did it go, you know, my daughter? I mean, this is the matchmaker. She's wanting to know. Give me the ins and outs of the story. And she told everything that Boaz had done. And how he had added, he gave me six measures of barley. And Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. By the way, isn't that the way love is? Uh, listen, when you do fall in love with somebody, uh, there's a persistence there. And I, I remember those days when I fell in love with Arlene. And I was persistent. And Naomi knows that. Well, okay, how do, what are we to make of the story? Again, uh, we talked about it. It's a crazy love story. It's the, the craziest first date that I've ever heard of. Well, how do you understand it? Now, listen, if you're a parent and you're looking for advice uh, about how to find a mate for one of your children, I, I don't think this is the place that you're going to want to look. Now, there are some principles you can pray for your children. Pray that they will meet someone of character. I mean, there's a lot of moral fiber in Ruth, and, a, and there's a strong moral fiber in Boaz. So, so, so you can pray for that. But I have to say, I don't trust, uh, I don't rely, or don't recommend the methods. Uh, ultimately, we need to be trusting in God <laughs> to bring people together. You know, not, not sort of forcing his hand. Now, I, I would say as well, let's say that you're single and you're looking for, you know, Mr. Wright or, or you know, Ms. Wright. 
Well, again, no, don't, don't compromise your character in order to find a mate. Again, look for somebody of character. This Ruth and, and Boaz, there's something very honorable. There's something innocent, frankly, quite naive, I think, but, but sweet and innocent and beautiful uh, in the beginning of this relationship. But what I want us to recognize is, you know, that this story, while it's romantic and, and while it's heartwarming, it's really not primarily about, you know, how am I going to find my soulmate or how do I find my life partner? What this story is all about, what we see going on here is what I'm calling a match made in heaven. It's not a match that is made by a scheming mother-in-law. Remember in the previous chapter when, when Ruth was out gleaning in the field, Boaz already noticed her. And, and remember he asked the question in chapter 2, verse 5, he said, you know, whose woman is that? So she had already kind of piqued his interest and he wanted to know more about her. And I have no doubt that, yes, he would have likely taken a slower route than Naomi intended. But I have no doubt that Boaz set his eyes on Ruth in chapter 2. And I have no doubt that he would have, at his own pace, and trusting in you know God's timing, he would have continued to investigate. And I'm still convinced that the marriage in chapter 4 would have occurred. But what I want us to see again is that the whole book of Ruth is a book about the sovereignty of God. God is the one who is the great matchmaker. Now, literally, God is the one, I believe, who is the great matchmaker. But we also need to recognize that it goes beyond the literal. And there are some other applications that we can make out of it. You see, what we've been seeing throughout the book of Ruth is that God works in spite of, not always because of, we can often try to manipulate the will of God. And I know in my experience that there have been times when I have literally tried to do that. I was absolutely convinced that God wanted me to do a certain thing. And I would go through all kinds of maneuvering in order to manipulate the circumstances so that what I thought was the will of God would in fact happen. And sometimes it didn't, or sometimes it did. And the results were not always good. Scripture talks about waiting on God, trusting in God. Not trying to trust in our own devices, but in all of our ways. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You know what I think is interesting is that in spite of Naomi's lack of faith, in spite of, I think, the unwise actions of Naomi and Elimelech when they went up to Moab, in spite of Naomi's risky scheming that could so easily have ended in disaster, the good news in all of this is that God is sovereign. You know, the good news is this, that even when we mess up, the grace of God is greater than all of our sin. God is the ultimate matchmaker. You see, God is not only the one that brings couples together, but God is the one who pursues us. Maybe you're watching this right now online and that in this story has kind of captivated your imagination. Listen, it had a, a, a literal, physical setting, but it has some principles that go beyond. And we talked last week about how Boaz, in so many ways, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as he desires to have a relationship with us. In fact, it's interesting that that Christians, the Christian church, and I don't mean the building, but, but Christians are referred to as the bride of Christ. Jesus is, in fact, the bridegroom. And when we come and put our faith and trust in Christ, of which Boaz is, I think, just an image, 
But ultimately, Jesus is the one who pursues us. Jesus is the one who provides for us. Jesus is the one who protects us. It's under his wings that we find forgiveness. It's under his wings. If you like, it's under his garment that we find forgiveness. And it's as we come and are joined to him when we put our faith and trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross, that we become joined to him, not, not in a marriage, in, in obviously in the physical sense, but in, in a spiritual sense, we are joined to Christ, and we will be with him forever. You see, this is a picture in the book of Ruth. It's a picture, it's a love story, and it's beautiful, it's tender, it's heartwarming, well, all of its intrigue and so on. But ultimately, it is a picture of God bringing Boaz and Ruth together, who, when they would come together in marriage, they, they would have descendants that ultimately would lead to the birth of Jesus Christ. In Bethlehem. You see, they, in their marriage, as we'll see next week, it begins a new chapter in God's plan of redemption as a godly man and a godly woman come together in marriage and have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so on, ultimately culminating in the birth of Jesus. And it illustrates how we can become part of God's family as well. You know, just as Ruth said to Boaz, and she said, spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are my kinsman, Redeemer. We can just Simply say, Lord Jesus, would you, in a sense, spread your garment over me? You are my kinsman redeemer. Would you forgive my sin? Would you be my savior? Would you provide for me? Would you protect me? The Bible says that when we come by faith to Jesus Christ, there is a whole new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. It's a match made in heaven. Shall we pray? I wonder today, as we've been thinking about this beautiful love story, where are you at in your own spiritual life? Maybe you're, you've been listening to this, and, and, and it's kind of starting to stir something up. And maybe you've never asked Jesus to come into your life. You've never asked him to be your Savior. You might want to just simply say this, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe in you. I believe that you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. That like Boaz, you are the one who provides and has made it possible for me to to be protected, to be forgiven, to be provided for. Would you come into my life? Will you be my savior? Will you forgive my failings, my shortcomings, and make me your child? If you've prayed that this morning, welcome into the family of God. And I would just say to all of us today, as we continue to move through the Advent season, as we continue as a church congregation to work through this season of transition, let's trust. Let's trust. Let's not try to force or manipulate or uh, do anything in a sense, self-serving, but let's trust that God in his sovereignty 
knows exactly what's going on, and we can trust him. And just how he took this most unusual situation and brought Ruth and Boaz together, we can trust that God is the one who will provide for all that we need as a church congregation, both today and in the days to come. Father God, thank you. We thank you and we bless you and we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Beautiful star.